verses 17 to 27. The people had religiously observed the orders given them concerning the besieging of Jericho, and now at length Joshua had told them, v 16, The Lord hath given you the city, enter and take possession. Accordingly in these verses we have the rules they were to observe in taking possession. God gives it to them, and therefore may direct it to what uses and intents, and clog it with what provisos and limitations he thinks fit. It is given to them to be devoted to God, as the first and perhaps the worst of all the cities of Canaan. The city must be burnt, and all the lives in it sacrificed without mercy to the justice of God. All this they knew was included in those words, v 17. The city shall be a churum, a devoted thing, at and all therein, to the Lord. No life in it might be ransomed upon any terms, they must all be surely put to death. So he appoints from whom as creatures they had received their lives, and to whom as sinners they had forfeited them, and who may dispute his sentence. Is God unrighteous, who thus takes vengeance? God forbid we should entertain such a thought. There was more of God seen in the taking of Jericho than of any other of the cities of Canaan, and therefore that must be more than any other devoted to him. And the severe usage of this city would strike a terror upon all the rest and melt their hearts yet more before Israel. Only, when this severity is ordered, Rahab and her family are accepted, she shall live and all that are with her. She had distinguished herself from her neighbors by the kindness she showed to Israel, and therefore shall be distinguished from them by the speedy return of that kindness. All the treasure of it, the money and plate and valuable goods, must be consecrated to the service of the tabernacle, and brought into the stock of dedicated things, the Jews say because the city was taken on the Sabbath day. Thus God would be honored by the beautifying and enriching of his tabernacle, thus preparation was made for the extraordinary expenses of his service, and thus the Israelites were taught not to set their hearts upon worldly wealth nor to aim at heaping up abundance of it for themselves. God had promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, not a land abounding with silver and gold, for he would have them live comfortably in it, that they might serve him cheerfully, but not covet either to trade with distant countries or to hoard for after times. He would likewise have them to reckon themselves enriched in the enriching of the tabernacle, and to think that which was laid up in God's house as truly their honor and wealth as if it had been laid up in their own. A particular caution is given them to take heed of meddling with the forbidden spoil, for what was devoted to God, if they offered to appropriate it to their own use, would prove accursed to them, therefore, v 18, in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, you will find yourselves inclined to reach towards it, but check yourselves, and frighten yourselves from having anything to do with it. He speaks as if he foresaw the sin of Achan, which we have an account of in the next chapter, when he gives this reason for the caution, lest you make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it, as it proved that Achan did. The entrance that was opened to them into the city by the sudden fall of the walls, or at least that part of the wall over against which they then were when they gave the shout, v 20 the wall fell down flat, and probably killed abundance of people, the guards that stood sentinel upon it, or others that crowded about it, to look at the Israelites that were walking round. We read of thousands killed by the fall of a wall. That which they trusted to for defense proved their destruction. The sudden fall of the wall, no doubt, put the inhabitants into such a consternation that they had no strength nor spirit to make any resistance, but they became an easy prey to the sword of Israel, and saw to how little purpose it was to shut their gates against a people that had the Lord on the head of them. The God of heaven easily can, and certainly will, break down all the opposing power of his and his church's enemies. Gates of brass and bars of iron are, before him, but a straw and rotten wood, ISA 45 colon 1, 2. Who will bring me into the strong city? Wilt not thou, O God? Thus shall Satan's kingdom fall, nor shall any prosper that harden themselves against God. The execution of the orders given concerning this devoted city. All that breathed were put to the sword, not only the men that were found in arms, but the women and children and old people. Though they cried for quarter, and begged ever so earnestly for their lives, there was no room for compassion, pity must be forgotten, they utterly destroyed all, v 21. 
If they had not had a divine warrant under the seal of miracles for this execution, it could not have been justified, nor can it justify the like now, when we are sure no such warrant can be produced. But, being appointed by the righteous judge of heaven and earth to do it, who is not unrighteous in taking vengeance, they are to be applauded in doing it as the faithful ministers of his justice. Work for God was then bloody work, and cursed was he that did it deceitfully, keeping back his sword from blood. But the spirit of the gospel is very different, for Christ came not to destroy men's lives but to save them, Christ's victories were of another nature. The cattle were put to death with the owners, as additional sacrifices to the divine justice. The cattle of the Israelites, when slain at the altar, were accepted as sacrifices for them, but the cattle of these Canaanites were required to be slain as sacrifices with them, for their iniquity was not to be purged with sacrifice and offering, both were for the glory of God. 2. The city was burnt with fire, and all that was in it, v. 24. The Israelites, perhaps, when they had taken Jericho, a large and well-built city, hoped they should have that for their headquarters, but God will have them yet to dwell in tents, and therefore fires this nest, lest they should nestle in it. 3. All the silver and gold, and all those vessels which were capable of being purified by fire, were brought into the treasury of the house of the Lord, not that he needed it but that he would be honored by it, as the Lord of hosts, of their hosts in particular, the God that gave the victory and therefore might demand the spoil, either the whole, as here, or, as sometimes, a tenth. The preservation of Rahab the harlot, or innkeeper, who perished not with those that believed not. The public faith was engaged for her safety by the two spies, who acted therein as public persons, and therefore, though the hurry they were in at the taking of the town was no doubt very great, yet Joshua took effectual care for her preservation. The same persons that she had secured were employed to secure her, v. 22, 23. They were best able to do it who knew her and her house, and they were fittest to do it, that it might appear it was for the sake of her kindness to them that she was thus distinguished and had her life given her for a prey. All her kindred were saved with her, like Noah she believed to the saving of her house, and thus faith in Christ brings salvation to the house, Acts 16.31. Some ask how her house, which is said to have been upon the wall, ch. 2.15, escaped falling with the wall, we are sure it did escape, for she and her relations were safe in it, either though it joined so near to the wall as to be said to be upon it, yet it was so far off as not to fall either with the wall or under it, or, rather, that part of the wall on which her house stood fell not. Now being preserved alive, she was left for some time without the camp to be purified from the Gentile superstition, which she was to renounce, and to be prepared for her admission as a proselyte. She was in due time incorporated with the Church of Israel, and she and her posterity dwelt in Israel, and her family was remarkable long after. We find her the wife of Salmon, Prince of Judah, mother of Boaz, and named among the ancestors of our Savior, Mt. 1:5. Having received Israelites in the name of Israelites, she had an Israelite's reward. Bishop Pearson observes that Joshua's saving Rahab the harlot, and admitting her into Israel, were a figure of Christ's receiving into his kingdom, and entertaining there, the publicans and the harlots, Mt. 2131. Or it may be applied to the conversion of the Gentiles. Jericho is condemned to a perpetual desolation, and a curse pronounced upon the man that at any time hereafter should offer to rebuild it, v. 26 Joshua adjured them, that is, the elders and people of Israel, not only by their own consent, obliging themselves and their posterity never to rebuild this city, but by the divine appointment, God himself having forbidden it under the sever penalty here annexed. God would hereby show the weight of a divine curse, where it rests there is no contending with it nor getting from under it, it brings ruin without remedy or repair. He would have it to remain in its ruins a standing monument of his wrath against the Canaanites when the measure of their iniquity was full, and of his mercy to his people when the time had come for their settlement in Canaan. The desolations of their enemies were witnesses of his favor to them, and would upbraid them with their ingratitude to that God who had done so much for them. The situation of the city was very pleasant, and probably its nearness to Jordan was an advantage to it, 
which would tempt men to build upon the same spot, but they are here told it is at their peril if they do it. Men build for their posterity, but he that builds Jericho shall have no posterity to enjoy what he builds, his eldest son shall die when he begins the work, and if he take not warning by that stroke to desist, but will go on presumptuously, the finishing of his work shall be attended with the funeral of his youngest, and we must suppose all the rest cut off between. This curse, not being a curse causeless, did come upon that man who long after rebuilded Jericho, 1 Key 1634, but we are not to think it made the place ever the worse when it was built, or brought any hurt to those that inhabited it. We find Jericho afterwards graced with the presence, not only of those two great prophets Elijah and Elisha, but of our blessed Saviour himself. Lastly, all this magnified Joshua and raised his reputation, v 27, it made him not only acceptable to Israel, but formidable to the Canaanites, because it appeared that God was with him of a truth, the word of the Lord was with him, so the Chalde, even Christ himself, the same that was with Moses. Nothing can more raise a man's reputation, nor make him appear more truly great, than to have the evidences of God's presence with him.